Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Um, Paul is in jail when he's writing this. He's in jail in Rome. He visited the church at Ephesus several years before this writing. And um, now he's, again, in prison, writing back to a place that he spent about three years there. Now, in my Bible right now, I'm, uh, I've turned uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And the reason I've done that for introduction is because I'm trying to get us into the life of Paul, into his journeys. The Apostle Paul was called to the Lord uh, on the road to Damascus, and he traveled around, spent the rest of his life traveling around the Mediterranean Sea, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the nations. So at one point, he was in the city of Corinth, which is across the Aegean Sea from Ephesus. They're not really very far away from each other as the crow flies, as you could sail across there. But uh, from, from Ephesus, he wrote to the Corinthians across there. And uh, in chapter 16, he says, I want to come to you. I want to come from Ephesus. Now, he's not going to sail this time. He's going to go up around by land over to Corinth. I want to come to you. I want to teach you some Bible. I want to bear some fruit among you, but I'm not coming right away. And uh, this is what I want you to see in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 9 by way of introduction. So Paul wrote to the Corinthians uh, from Ephesus about his traveling plans. This is what he said. But I will stay, I'm not coming right now, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. I'm staying here because there's a wide door of effective ministry happening here in Ephesus. And so he's going to stay there a little bit longer. Now where I'm going to go in this sermon is right there. There is a wide door open in Boynton Beach. There's a huge door open. In fact, I hope through the process of this, and there's going to be a good bit of biblical history, there's going to be a good bit of just the life of this church history in what we're going to look at in this passage of Scripture. And I hope that by bringing out what Paul is writing in Ephesians 5, 15 through 21, we'll gain a greater appreciation for that wide door that's open to us right here, right now. So that's where we're headed. If you turn in your Bibles, if you're not already there, to Ephesians chapter 5, and beginning in verse 15, let's read it together down through verse 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now what I want us to see just in the beginning is, is just what he says. Look carefully then how you're walking. Now that's reminiscent going back to chapter 4 verse 1 where we're to walk worthy. I think about walking. Uh, sometimes I bring the sports illustration in, uh, to, to give us an understanding. There are a lot of... I, I think about basketball. Think about basketball. Now, I, I never was a, a great basketball player by any stretch of the imagination, but it's interesting. A basketball player will look at the goal. He'll look at the rim. In fact, basketball coaches tell young players, take a look at that rim and then look at that net. That net kind of hangs down almost like a V 
what I want you to do is I want you to aim for the center of that V. And so he may be dribbling the ball like this, but when it comes time to shoot, he's looking straight at that. He's not looking at the ball, not looking at his hands. He's looking straight at that. Even a pitcher, when he's pitching, will, will, will focus in on that catcher's glove. He's not looking at the ball or these kinds of things. He's focusing on that glove, and he knows what he wants to do with the ball. But here, the apostle is actually talking about walking. And when I think about walking and focusing in on walking, I automatically think of these people who walk on the tightrope. You know? Is that amazing stuff? Those Valdinis, those people that get up there and they walk on it. And, and I was curious. I've never done it. Don't know. And I was curious. What do they look at? I mean, I'm thinking, I'm keeping my eye on that wire, right? You'd think so. Not true. Not true. In fact, the same thing is similar to these, the, to the gals on the balance beam. You see those incredible things they do on the balance, flipping, doing all these kinds of things on four inches, four inches. What, what are they looking at? And I learned both the tightrope walker and the balance beam people looking at the same thing. You know what they're looking at? They're looking at the very end spot. If it's a balance beam, they're looking at the end of the balance beam right there. If you're walking a tightrope, he looks. It's usually colored in some way, so it keeps his focus. Maybe orange tape around the wire, yellow tape or something like that around the wire. So that as, as they're walking, that's where they're, not here, but there. Focusing there. And I look at these words, and he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise. And I'm wondering where we're supposed to be looking. I'm wondering where we're supposed to be looking. Now, if I'm right about what's going on in this passage of Scripture, I think the Apostle Paul is doing something. He, he's, he's summarizing much of what he has said before. Especially when we take a look at this walking. When we look at the walking, as I've already said, he goes back to... Um, chapter chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And, and so he's asking them to look very carefully as a wise person. And I, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that all through the book, I, I turn back to chapter 1, verse 17. I'm looking at chapter 1, verse 17. It's in the middle of the sentence. I do not give, I cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers. And then 17, chapter 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope. What is the hope of your calling? Now, here's where I'm going with this. I think that he's calling them to walk wise. Several places, he's asking them to understand, to gain knowledge. And each time that he says, I want you to have wisdom, each time he says, I, I want you to have this understanding or to gain this knowledge, he's talking about the big picture of God. He's talking about what God is doing in all of redemptive history. Now, that's my phrase of saying all the Bible story from, from Genesis, right? From creation and the fall. And he immediately, right there in Genesis 3.15, the fall, he gives a what we call a pre-evangelistic message saying one day this evil one will be defeated. He will be defeated. And we see biblical history carried out uh, through people like Noah, uh, through people like Abraham, and Moses on through uh, the, the wilderness wanderings with Moses into the land and during the times of the kings and the prophets and God promising over and over that he will send his Messiah. Uh, we get even to a place, in my opinion, of in between the Testaments and God is mightily at work. Uh, the, the Jewish people are preserving the scriptures the Jewish people are setting up local places of worship in between the Testaments. Why? Because the temple has been torn down. And so now they must meet in local places. 
uh, God ushered in the Greeks. And the Greeks conquered the entire region. And when they conquered the entire region, they taught everybody their education. They taught everybody their language. And so now, anybody within the entire Mediterranean region had to speak one single language. Uh, Transportation was increased during those days. Education was increased. The Greeks wanted to make sure that Everyone had an education. And so no matter what city they conquered, they set up what they called a gymnasium. Now, you and I think that's just athletic events, but a gymnasium was a place of education. And this is what the Greeks did. And then the Greeks were conquered by the Romans, and the Romans came in and built roads. The Romans came in and built new buildings. They came in and and built new ships and ways to travel much more quickly. Uh, They brought in a legal system that brought peace to the area. And all of a sudden, at this very point in the Roman, God sent forth his son into the world at an incredible time of developing all that he wanted to. Now he's preserved the scriptures. Now there's local places to worship. Now there's a single language. I can write a letter in Greek and send it anywhere I want to, and they're going to be able to understand it. People are going to be able to read because of the education that had been brought to each of the cities. They're going to be able to travel legally, with the proper documents because the Romans have brought in the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, and people can travel and do business in different places. You see, God in between the Testaments was not asleep. God was developing and, and, and making way and preparation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the birth of his son is Galatians 4.4. 4. At the proper time, he sent forth his son. Nothing, even to, you think about it. I know we've got the Twitters and the Facebooks and the things now, and really there's no reason why the gospel can't go into every nation of the world today. But without all of this technology, without all of these kinds of things, in a matter of a few short years, the gospel spread all over the Mediterranean world that Jesus had been born of of a woman, born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, that he paid the sacrifice for you and for me that we we could not pay. We weren't worthy even of paying our own sacrifice, but he paid it on our behalf. God took my sin and put it on Jesus, and Jesus died in my place. And the Apostle Paul called to spread that good news all around made disciples, planted churches, and many people came to know the Lord during these days. And Paul is encouraging these churches and others by writing to them and encouraging them that we have the scriptures until finally the end of the first century when the apostle John, probably, probably the pastor of the churches in Ephesus and the churches that were around Ephesus, John was their pastor. And John uh, was persecuted and then finally exiled to an island just off, just a short ways away from Ephesus in which God gave him the revelation and said, these are the things that are about to happen. That's the, that's the biblical big picture. And when we get to Ephesians in the middle of that picture, God is saying, you haven't always understood this plan that I have throughout all of history. You haven't always understood it. In fact, most of the time back here in the Old Testament, you think it's just for one nation, just to speak to one group of people, just to speak to Israel and only Israel. But when Jesus came on the scene and then the apostles after him, he said that there is a mystery. And plainly speaking, Ephesus is about making sure you understand making sure that you're wise too, making sure that you have the knowledge of that God's plan was not just for Israel, but for everyone. And in fact, this division that came between Jewish people and Gentile people has now been broken down. There's no wall between us anymore. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free male nor female. In Christ, we are one. That's Ephesians. That's the big picture of what he's saying in the letter to the Ephesians. 
And Paul is saying this, he's writing this to this group of people who are living in a multicultural world. They're living in a, in, in a world of a variety of ethnic groups. They're living in a variety of, of different religious backgrounds. He's writing to a place where there's a cult called the cult of Artemis. And, and there's a, a, an idol that's there in the middle of this. And they make their living off of this. And, and so in the midst of this history of this amalgamation of people, God is saying, you're to be one. And I'm thinking, wow. That's kind of like kind of like the United States. Haven't we seen it? You know, Statue of Liberty, bring all your poor, your weak, bring them together. We're hearing a lot about immigration still today. I know there's a lot of buzz things happening on about that political issue. But the United States was founded on the biblical principles and, and the love for the word of God. Uh, I, I think about Christianity and how it moved up to that point. Uh, I think about not only the, the big picture of the past as far as biblical history, but even the history of Christianity. It started out, had a rough go as far as persecution. A lot of people being persecuted in the er early centuries. And when they were persecuted, they were forced, forced to determine what is it that we really believe. See, when you're under the crunch, when somebody says your life is on the line, you want to know what you're going to die for. And the church came together and they started talking about things. Well, who was Jesus and what was his real nature? Was he, was he just a man or was he just God or was he both? And they, they hammered these things out until they determined early on that he is fully God and fully man. But it was under persecution until about 312 when Constantine came along and said, from now on I want everybody to be a Christian. I want the people in the army to be a Christian. And uh, if you're going to operate in the government, I want you to be a Christian. And there's one problem with that. When you start mandating for somebody to be a Christian, it's not what? Huh? It's not really what? It's not really what's in their heart. And all of a sudden, there's this man-made religion set up. And this man-made structure of religion lasted for about a thousand years until people like Tyndale and Wycliffe started saying, you know, I think people ought to have the Bible in their own language and started translating in English and German. And this was anathema to the church. And so once again, persecution was moved in and the Inquisition was brought in. Until people like Calvin and Luther and Zwingli and the reformers said, unless you can show it to me in the word of God, I, I, I'm, I'm not going with you. I'm not going. And this is the 1500s and the 1600s. But what also happened in the world during these times, and if you'll stay with me, I do have a point. What happened in the world during these times is this is the time of, of, of great discovery, of world discovery. You know, 1492, what? Boom. They're sailing all over the world, discovering new people and new ways of things. And people are beginning to see that other people in the world do things differently than they do. Not only do they do a lot of things differently than they do, but they have a different religion. And they have a different God. And they go about doing things differently. And we have the development of the modern world. And the modern world began to move in in the age of enlightenment and basically said, if I can't see it, if I can't taste it, if I can't touch it, it really can't be real. And during the 1700s, started taking things out of the Bible. Even our own founders, a lot of people, well, we're founded on, on biblical principles. You know, Thomas Jefferson has his own Bible. And it is anathema. He just simply went into it and started cutting out things that he didn't want, that he didn't like, basically the miracles and many other teachings. And so, because, why? Because if I can't see it, if I can't test it, if I can't, put the, if I can't put the scientific methodology on it, if I can't test it, it must not be real. 
It, it can't be real. And we moved into this modern age. And then biblical scholars began to say, well, you know, maybe I can take that same method and I can apply it here. And we saw this in the late 1800s and into the 1900s, into the 1960s, until we reached the 1970s and, and people began to see how people were just basically going in and ripping out from their Bibles places that they didn't like. And we were losing the Bible. We were losing the inerrant word of God. And men and women across this country stood up in revolt. And schools and Bible colleges and different things were the result of trying to return to the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And churches were growing. And the fact is, is in the 1970s, the church, I believe, experienced a mini revival. I skipped over the great awakenings of the 1700s, should have included them, but I'm, I'm trying to move along for those of you who are not all that thrilled about history. But there's a point. And that point is, is in, the, in the 70s, churches were growing. We were filling them over two or three times over in the 1970s. Why, if a young man, a young lady could strum a guitar, they could put 300 kids in a basement that could only hold 30. Back in the days of young life and Campus for Crusade for Christ and the different ministries that were going on, we experienced what I believe in the 1970s, a revival. And then in the 1980s, we do what Christians do. We tried to can it. So that you could go to a church and they, they're going to they're gonna advertise. October 13th through October 17th, we're going to have revival. We're going to take what God did in some spontaneous work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to put it into some kind of formula. I could go on the web right now and put up here on your screens how to have a revival. It's on the net. How to. This is step one. It's step two. Step three. Step four. This is how to have a revival. That's what we went through. And the problem with it is, to a certain extent, it worked. That's the problem. It actually worked. At least in the way most people count worked. More people came. We had banners. We had orchestras. We had camels and we had sheep and we had all kinds of things. In the house of God, we had a presentation going on. We had a great presentation. And, you know, we stood and we sang, and it was just incredible. It was, honestly, it was, a, it was a good time. And many people would come and visit the churches for Christmas, for Easter. And they would see this great presentation. And then they'd go home. And the church didn't grow through these presentations. And we got to the 90s. And we had promise keepers, and men were getting together. We have ladies' Bible study, and women were getting together. And numbers were coming together. And again, it looked like that we were going to experience a movement of God and praying for those times. And we moved into the 2000s. And from the 2000s to this moment right now, and even to the late 1990s, the church had been going down, 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 down in its membership, down in its attendance, down. Enter the First Baptist Church of Boynton Beach, established in 1925. Uh, the corner here didn't look anything like it looks now. Um, building was built, and later on, the new auditorium, the, which we call the old auditorium now, was built. And then the different additions that came on. Three services eventually for the First Baptist Church over in, uh, on the, in the old chapel there. Then in 2004, after praying through it in the 90s, in the 90s, in the 90s, this church bought property on out west, all the way a half a mile on the other side of I-95. Back then, it, it was out west. And said, you know, I think maybe we need to move out west. And they came together and they prayed. And you know what it said? God has planted us here. This is where God wants us to be. On this corner, this is where the First Baptist Church of Boynton Beach has been planted, and this is where we should grow. And that's the big picture. That's the picture because I realized that probably half of you 
if not more than that, haven't been here that very many years now. Uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but you don't know the history of this church. There came a specific time in the life of this church that said this is where this church should be. And then this building was built. And by God's grace, if you stick around for the members meeting, you'll see that God is delivering us from our debt and we're being set free. And I want to tell you, I have a reason why I believe God is setting us free. Because there's a wide door for the gospel being opened. When you look at our, our life today, our, our culture, our society today, we want to shake our heads. Man, this, this place is just, okay, fine. It's going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, it's just going down. Morally, we are looking at the situation. I'm moving now from the past to the present. And, and I'm saying, we look around us and, and we need to see the present. We need to understand it. But when we look at the present and we see the moral status of what's going on around us, we shouldn't be as Christians. And that's what he's saying, walk worthy as wise people here. I actually believe what he's saying here is look at the big picture, see the big picture, see the past, see where you fit in it, recognize present, see the present right now, but in seeing the present and seeing the moral decline, a Christian ought to see it differently. A Christian ought to see it as a wide door that's opening up. It's different than it was in the 60s when the deacons all stood out back and smoked and everybody just kind of, you know, treated religion as this cultural thing that we did. We go to church because grandma went to the church. But now going to church is so culturally counterculture that there's a wider door open. Do you follow my meaning? Do you understand? We now have an opportunity to shine brighter than we ever have before. Because there's a wide door open. We're different. And we're supposed to be different. Now, what I want to show you is not only the, the past and the present, but I want you to see what I believe is Paul's point. And, and I'm not going to keep you here all day, but look carefully then how you walk not as unwise, but wise. Every time he brings up wisdom or knowledge in the, in the letter prior to this, he's talking about the big picture of God's redemptive plan. Making the best use of, and there's a little technicality, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. The time. There's an article, both in English and in Greek, in front of the word time. It is the time. It's not the times so that you think he's strictly talking about the present. He's talking about the time. He's, no matter when that is, I want you, uh, I want you to make, make the best use of it. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Because where we're living now is evil. When we look around at the present, we don't need... I mean, really. I'm not going to say it. Therefore, do not be foolish. There it is again. He wants understanding. We can go back and look at all the places that he, he tells us to use our heads. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's to understand what the will of the Lord is. If I'm correct and what he's doing is summarizing the book, then he's standing back and doing everything that I've just done. I'm not going to do it again. Whether it's the Old Testament to the New Testament or where Ephesians is, he's simply saying, understand what the will of the Lord is. You go back to chapter 1, you go back to chapter 1 and you start looking at every time that, that will comes up. He's an apostle by the will of God, even in verse 1. Verse 5, he predestined us adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. That's what God is doing. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance 
having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. What God is, God's speaking to him here, and he said, I want you to understand what the will of the Lord is, and it's, it's him. He's, he's got, what, 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 what do we say? He's got everything in what? He's got everything in his hands. He created it all the way up. You know, feet broke down the wall, and now we're together as one. And he's building his kingdom all the way up to the First Baptist Church of Boynton Beach. The point is, I want you to be wise about where you are. You are here. Ephesus has got religious plurality going on. Ephesus has got ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic groups, multicultural groups. Well, surprise, you live in it. You live in the same world. And you know what Paul said? I'm going to stay here. You want to know why I'm going to stay here for now? Because there's a wide door open. Is anybody hearing me? There's a wide door open. You know, I came here about eight and a half years ago. And, uh, and yep, we all wish there were more seats filled today than, than there are. Nobody prays for that and wishes for that more than I do. And I've asked the Lord through the years how to direct this congregation. And the Lord has said to me, I want you to stay the course. I want you to stay the course. I'm grateful for the many wonderful things that have happened. I'm grateful for the praise and worship that we have. I'm grateful for the elders that we have. I'm grateful for the young men and the young women that God has sent here to us. But when 2018 hit, God said, no more staying the course. No more staying the course. But we're going to be unfolding some things over the next weeks and months to present to you. And uh, we now find ourselves in a place in Romans 1 for a different reason. But we now find ourselves in the place of no excuse. No excuse. We have resources, both financial and human. And there is a wide door open to us. God is calling us to it. The Apostle Paul goes on to say how he wants us to do this, and I want to turn our attention to that as we move a little bit further through the text and, and finish sometime today. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not, do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. How are we to see? How are we to see? The Bible is very clear. We do not see with the physical sight. We see by faith. Even hope is not hope if it is seen, Paul writes in another place. Uh, the hope that we have, faith is not the things that we see, but the things that are unseen. How do we see? How do we see where we are? And how do we see how to go from where we are to where God wants us to be? We see it by faith. We see it. There's several texts that uh, you see there on the bottom of your screen that you can see about, um, about faith and, and uh, being filled with the Spirit. 11.1 um, in Hebrews, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Uh, Romans 8, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. How do we see the way ahead? We 
we see it by faith. And he gives us some basic things or basic evidences, I'm going to say. Basic evidences. He gives five evidences for the fact that it's happening in your midst. Look at the text once again. First of all, he says uh, to be filled. By the way, what time is it? Oh, it's not too bad. I am worked up about this. I like the way he says filled with the Spirit because if we took time to do another, if I'm right about the summary, this is a summary passage, and we went back and started going from chapter 1, 2, and 3, and 4 and saw what's going on every time the Spirit is mentioned, we would see that we've been sealed with the Spirit. Because we have the Spirit now, we have, we're, we're guaranteed an inheritance. Again, big picture. The, our future grace that God is going to give to us because we have so if 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 we're the family of God if we're one in Christ because the spirit has made us so if we're to maintain the unity of the body in a bond of peace by the spirit if he's teaching us how to walk look carefully how you're walking not as unwise but as wise how do we do it we do that by the Spirit. We do that by the Spirit, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I don't actually think that the Apostle Paul has stopped the big picture of the gospel to give us a dietary law. If you thought and you read through this passage, you said, oh, we're going to hear a sermon about not drinking today. We're going to hear a sermon about the sins of alcohol. And there's plenty there, and there's plenty in the Proverbs and on and on. But I don't think that's what the Apostle Paul is doing at all. I don't think he's giving a dietary instruction. I think he's actually speaking to his audience once again with something that they can understand. When you get drunk with wine, you stagger about and you do stupid things. Don't do that. But be filled with the Spirit. Stay on the big picture. Stay on God's redemptive plan. Stay on the plan God has for the First Baptist Church of Boynton Beach. And how are you going to do that? First of all, you're going to speak to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. That's kind of weird. Okay. Really? That's what we're going to do? You know what, I, what I've been trying to stress to you, and the reason I went back to 1 Corinthians is because of that stark, wide door that's open. And I tried to bring that home to you by saying that the morality and our current situation in contemporary life is just running so hard in the opposite direction that we are. That for somebody to speak to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs is so starkly different than that for brothers and sisters to come in. Now, let me, parentheses, in this list that he's talking about, songs, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in our heart, these kinds, of, it seems to be an amalgamation that there's, there's no uh, distinction between those. And there is very little distinction. I don't think that's the point. I think he's only got two points, and he begins at the beginning and the end. Look, 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 look. Addressing one another... See, there it is. It's the one another. Now read it. It's the one another. Concentrate on the one another. Okay, now. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody to the Lord. It's actually the way they wrote. I'm not going to go into the technicalities of it, but I simply want you to know there's only two parts to this. And the two parts are how you walk, how you walk as not unwise but wise. One of the contrasting ways to your culture is that you speak to one another. That the world sees you speaking to one another in a starkly different way. In psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. I mean, yeah, I have a habit. Anybody who knows me knows what my habit is. Keith knows what my habit is. My wife knows what my habit is. Secretaries, the staff knows what my habit is. You know what my habit is? I'm a whistler. Right, Jenny? Right? 
Right, right, Sharon? Keith, I'm a whistler. I whistle. It's a habit. I don't think about it too much. I whistle all the time. I whistle. People come up to me, whether in the grocery store or what. I try not to do it too much in public anymore because I'm trying to be more dignified. But uh, it's been throughout my whole life. You could ask anybody, wherever I live, neighborhood or wherever I went, vacation or whatever. Oh, there's the whistler. He's a whistler. And people would ask me, boy, you sure do sound happy. And the reality is, I whistle all the time, no matter if I'm happy or if I'm sad. And it's not to fake out that I'm happy when I'm sad or anything like that. It's just a habit. It's just a habit. Oh, my friends, I think not as unwise but as wise as thinking people speak to one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's victory in Jesus. Amen. You know, how firm a foundation is laid for the saints. You know, speak to one another in, in, in songs and hymns. I got to admit, I, I, I've been, I was doing some work, other kind of work, and I clicked on the Christian contemporary music today and listened to those songs and clicked it back off. Because the theology, and it just drives me bonkers. You know? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sifting sand. Man, I'll tell you what, tell somebody that. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. His child and forever I am. Speak to one another in psalms. And, boy, you're weird. You are weird. Oh, we are to be a peculiar people. First Baptist Church of Boynton Beach. To one another. But then look what it says also. Corporately coming in here. I am so grateful that this is a singing church. I haven't even got a preaching point. You people sing so well, I can't even pound on that. There was a time when I first became a Christian, I'd look around the room, and pretty much men. I thought, man, if that's what a Christian was, and Paul is trying to say just the opposite. Why, there ought to be something so starkly different when we talked about, back in the other chapter, about putting off and putting on a new law, stopping and starting, just, just putting off is not good enough. And just stopping is not good enough. There ought to be something starkly different on the other side of zero that you're evident. Making melody to the Lord with your heart. I realize some of your translations say... Um, um, by the heart. I really like that translation. But here, making melody to the Lord, it, it, it doesn't mean in your heart. It doesn't mean in your heart. It's not like, you know, Hannah was praying silently, her lips were moving back in the Old Testament. Or, you know, make me in Jesus, my Well, I make a melody in my... No. That's not what the text is saying. The text is saying all of your heart. It ought to be so starkly different that whether you're speaking to one another in Psalms and hymns or, sp or speaking to the Lord, that's the dual thing that's happening in this passage. Either one ought to be with all of your heart. We ought to be singing. So there are five participles here addressing one another, then singing is another one, making melody is another one, the third one, the fourth one is giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks. What do you mean giving thanks? Do you have any idea who our president is? I said I wasn't going to say that. Do you know... You know our culture is just going down. Look what's happening. What do you mean? Yes. Giving thanks to God for everything. Because this is your opportunity. You want to flip back and see filthy talk, jokes, you know, coarse jesting, and not speaking to one another in truth. That's what's back here. Now he's saying what? The contrast, the stark contrast of the believer is giving thanks for everything. Praise God. It has been granted to you not only to believe, but also to suffer. 
Give thanks in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. To thank God for everything. And then last, lastly, in this world of selfishness, lastly, in this world of selfishness, of I, I, it's all for me. Uh, the Gospels that are being preached today are just absolutely horrendous. The largest church in America today, with tens of thousands of people listening, are not even preaching the Gospel. In fact, preaching a false gospel that according to Paul in Galatians says that that person is to be accursed, anathema. It's still the largest church in America today. We come to a place where we are not supposed to say me, mine, but esteeming one another more highly than ourselves, we are to submit to one another in the fear, the phobos, the reverence of Christ. Why? Why do we say that? Think about it. Submit to one another. Submit to one another. See what it says in the last phrase? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of fear for Christ. What sense does that make? I tell you, it only makes sense that Paul is bringing home the big picture. That It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. There's coming a time when this big picture will come to an end. And we are sub to submit to one another in the fear of Christ. We're supposed to be different people. I think about my, my little whatever few years of, of being a Christian. I got my hymnal up here. That's kind of a fun thing to do. Back there, just to open it up. I didn't, the, the, the pages aren't marked. Don't panic, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. Right there, wow. Just as I am, how many verses do you know? There's 14 in this edition. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's just to turn, um, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns. All mu See, see the, I didn't play in this. The message, the point of this message is in that. If you see it, if you see it, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne, hark how the heavenly anthem, the heavenly song, the heavenly anthem does what? The heavenly anthem does what? It drowns all other music but its own. That's the point of this message. I didn't even plan it. I just wanted to turn to a few hymns. When God's people are, are speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in their heart, oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, church. Speak to one another. I, I came. Uh, I, I, my mumbling here is because I'm hesitant. When I came to know the Lord, Amy Grant was singing My Father's Eyes. I like that song then. My Father's Eyes. Keith Green was singing Oh Lord, You Are Beautiful. Steve Green was singing Find Us Faithful. We were singing in churches El Shaddai. Remember that? Some of you remember that. The Gaithers are because, because you look good for me. I'm not going to do anything bigger than that. I'm not going to do that. Shout to the Lord. I love shout to the Lord because it was the north and the south and the east and the west. And the church was going out because there was a wide door open. DC Talk started that rap stuff. I hadn't gotten used to it yet. Yeah. I love the music that the, the Gettys are doing, but I tell you, a great message right here. Who, O oh Lord, can save themselves? The, their own soul could heal. It's a question. Who can do that? Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace goes deeper still.
You alone can rescue. You, O oh Lord, have made a way. The great divide you heal. For when our hearts were far away, your love went further still. It's the big picture. All the way back here to the fall. All the history and stuff that I've done today is to say that you're here and I'm here and we're to be so radically different in this place called Boynton Beach. Why? Because today, this day in 2018, there is a wide door open and people need to hear that even though the moral mass is so deep, your grace is greater still. Pray with me, would you? Lord, I pray that we would receive this word from Ephesians that we would walk as wise, not unwise, knowing the times, knowing all of history, but yes, knowing our place in it. And in this place, in this place where you've planted us, that we would take the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to the person who lives next door to us, to the person who lives in this municipality, to the person who lives in our church field. God, I pray that we would set all things aside for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name.